Okay, so Beowulf it is. Um, let me say a few things about Beowulf. I'm backtracking now. I, I jumped forward to Dante writing in the 13th century, 14th century, because of the connection with Virgil and the connection between the Italian Renaissance uh, in a Christianized Italy uh, where art and uh, the epic has been transformed by Christian convictions so that the old cosmology that Virgil would have known and Homer would have known has been uh, not replaced by a Christian cosmology but the details have been filled in and there's a purpose to life and it's not to go down to the underworld that's not the the end of life is not to go down into the underworld where you live a shadowy existence and wish that you'd never died. And all of the glorious deeds that you've done, you might have them sung on in, by posterity if you were great enough, and that's your only means of holding on to your life is having fame. That's it, nothing else. Live a good and noble life because that's the best you can hope for is people to remember you well. That's not the Christian view. The Christian view now is that there is a purpose and meaning for all life and a glorious life which is lived by Christ and which he includes us in if we have faith in what he did and it brings us to heaven so and it, so it's a, a purpose it has an eschatology there's a direction to it it's not just the circle of life like the Lion King suggests it's not just a return to the same thing every generation and it's sort of meaningless it's just that, oh, well, my body gets to be fed on by the worms, which are fed on by the, the lesser vertebrates, and then the, the greater vertebrates eat them, and then we eat them. And that's part of the circle of life. Isn't that great? Grandpa's body gets eaten by the worms, and it's all one big symbiotic ecosystem. Isn't that wonderful? Not really, actually. It suggests that a human being is no different than an amoeba in the circle of life. That's dehumanizing. The ancients would not have held such a ridiculous view. They simply wouldn't. They recognize that there's a nobility to mankind. We have capacities that exceed those of uh, animals. We also have capacities that are far worse than animals. Animals don't do evil things. Human beings do. Animals don't do noble things. Although there are some animals that seem more noble, like horses and dogs, domestic, certain domesticated animals that do uh, remind us a bit of what nobility encourages life still. Um, but we've, we've mo we're going to move away from the, the Renaissance for the time being and that continuity with the Greco-Roman world and just shift our gaze a little bit northward uh, to Scandinavia, to northern, uh, to England, but in the time uh, where the writer is writing in Anglo-Saxon. Now, Anglo-Saxon would be the language that was written uh, in which, uh, the language that was spoken, rather, in England between the 5th century and the 11th century. The Angles and the Saxons leave northern Germany, <coughs> northwestern Germany, and go over into Britain, and they bring their language with them, which is Germanic. And the English language to this day has a, a Germanic grammar as a result of that. A lot of our words, uh, our core words, come from German. And so there's similarities between Anglo-Saxon and, and even modern English. And I say 10, 11th century because in 1066, William the Conqueror comes across and he brings a different language with him which is Latin and, and French. And those start to become mixed with the Anglo-Saxons. And the Anglo-Saxons are the common people in the, the French and the Norman languages and the Norman court sensibilities are the aristocrats. And that play between the aristocratic French type individuals and the Anglo-Saxons being the common people, that becomes a matter of um, conflict and comedy in later writing, but not here. This is written in Anglo-Saxon, so it's written before uh, the Norman conquest changes the English language. 
so we know it's in that period. Now, when exactly in the period? Well, that's up for uh, debate because we don't know who the author is. He's just called the Beowulf poet. It's anonymous. Um, it's, it's probably written, uh, some people say, in the 8th century. But again, not exactly sure. When it is written in that period, it's looking backwards to a time in the ancient past. It's writing to a past in which the characters were not Christian, to a pre-Christian period. But the author is Christian. And I'll explain from the poem why we know that is so. But the, the reasons are obvious because he refers to biblical texts. And, and so the author may be, but the, but the characters he describes are not. Other than occasionally they make sort of references to things that they are anachronistic. They couldn't have known this. But that, so there's a sense of uh, the, the poet writing about the ancient past in the same way that uh, we write historical dramas now. Like Tolkien, the great example, is writing about Middle Earth in, that's a long time ago. That, this is not that long ago, but it is looking backwards. And this was a great, of great interest to Tolkien, by the way, Beowulf, a foundational essay that he writes in this volume called The Monsters and the Critics. And it's, it's become now the great English epic poem, even if it's Anglo-Saxon, um, largely because of Mr. Tolkien. Tolkien argues that this is not just uh, a, a poem that is of interest to you know, people interested in antiquities or in ancient anthropo anthropological studies. He states that this is a great poem unto itself. In fact, he calls it an epic and says that it should be studied as such. And uh, I think he's won the day on this. It is by and law, large accepted that this is the great English epic, the first epic written in English because of his efforts. So if you wanted to read The Monsters and the Critics, you could do that. I'm not going to get into that too much. It also talks about translating Beowulf of, of great interest if you're, inter if you're interested in such things. I'm not going to get into that here. But the poem, which we're going to read, is here translated. And you can see on the screen behind me, on your left, the original Anglo-Saxon poem. And what, what you'll notice about it is that there's a gap in the middle of each line. And this is typical of the Anglo-Saxon style. If, if you could read it in the original, you would notice that it also is heavily alliterative. It, it contains consonants three times in each line, or sounds. So there's an internal rhyme. When we think of rhyme, we think of N rhyme. Like words that sound the same at the end of a line, that's what we call rhyme. In Anglo-Saxon poetry, you can also do beginning rhyme, and that's what we call alliteration. That's just the same sound at the beginning of every word, like ta-ta-ta. What do we have here? What way gardena in gardagum, gardag. You'll find that throughout the entire poem, that it alliterates every single line, and that there's a pause in between. And the older uh, hymns in the English language, actually the English language in general, has a natural pause in the middle of a poetic line. And you'll, you'll see that it's picked up often in 18th century poems and so forth. I won't get off track with that either. Um, but the main theme here of the, po of the poem, and this is why it's of interest, not just because it's an epic, but because it's a poem about the conflict between good and evil. which is plainly then influenced by religious um, motivations. The Odyssey is not any more than the Iliad, a poem about the conflict between good and evil. It's sort of hard to imagine, but Homer is actually not saying that the Trojans are evil. He admires Hector. He admires um, the opponents of the Greeks. He presents them in some ways as better than the Greeks. He's, he's happy to do that. They're not evil. He's not dehumanizing them. These are great heroes unto their, in their own right. They just happen to lose. They happen to be the opponents, but he doesn't demonize them. He's not calling them evil. 
And to some degree, I'm not even sure that uh, Virgil is doing that in the Aeneid. He is presenting the Carthaginians as Rome's great enemies, but he's not defining them as evil. Their character is not evil. They just are opponents. But here we do see a portrait between good and evil. And that in itself is already an indication that we're dealing with a Christian conceptualization of the way of looking at life. It's got a moral framework in all things. It's obviously exemplified in conflict. There's going to be three conflicts, in fact, and the three conflicts are not the same. Uh, not, it's not just the names of the, of, the, of the opponents that are different. The figures of evil represent different types of evil. But we'll have a physical conflict between uh, the first battle between Beowulf, who represents the good, and Grendel, who represents evil. And Grendel really is evil. Grendel does extremely bad things. She eats, he eats people. He eats them alive. Tears them apart and he hates them. He, he wants to destroy. He hates the light. He dwells in dark places. He's a descendant of Cain. The Beowulf poet is making, we can't be under any illusions that he represents, there's anything good in him. He is an evil being. And he comes from his mother, who's even more evil than he. She dwells in the depths of the sea, in a hellish place. She's a, a, from the pit. And in the third battle that we'll see, we're not going to get to it today, uh, Beowulf will fight against a dragon. And in Christian iconography, a dragon is a representation of the serpent, of the devil himself. It's not just, you, you read about uh, dragons, and, and if you go to uh, uh, studies these days, comparing the appearance of dragons in cultures all over the world, it's really interesting. It's not just a Western tradition. You feel you, there are dragons in China. There's dragons in uh, South America. There are dragons in North America. Whether it's firebirds, thunder, I mean, whatever, different types of beasts that seem to be not—they're not just figurative of something. They seem to be describing a historic entity. Same in Africa, all over. Dragons. But the association of the dragon with an evil being or the evil being is a particularly Christian association, a clarity that comes with that. So I personally think that there were dragons, and they probably were dinosaurs, what we would call dinosaurs. But the dinosaurs were not evil. What they were connected to and represent, that's what evil was. In the same way the serpent in the garden is not evil, because snakes aren't evil. But that particular serpent, which was able to speak, <coughs> and seduce mankind to commit original sin, that was evil. That's a, that's a very special type of snake. It's not just snakes are evil. Kill all the snakes. St. Patrick um, legendarily drove the snakes out of Ireland. No snakes in Ireland. He drove all the evil out of Ireland is what's being symbolized that. The fox hunt in Britain, foxes are vermin associated with the devil. When you chase the fox, you're hunting the devil. It takes, it's an iconography, it's an iconographic thing. So a fox hunt, why do the nobility hunt foxes? Because the nobility are opposed to evil in the kingdom, and this is the, it's an allegorical act. I mean, they are vermin. Fox are terrible things. They'll kill all your livestock just for the sake of it. They're sneaky, but they represent something greater than themselves. So there is a, a battle between good and evil, which I think makes this poem very interesting and, and very much in a sense like how Dante has portrayed things. Um, but note that in this, and this is the, uh, I think the sophistication of the poem, good and evil are not presented as sides or as mutually exclusive opposites. They are presented as qualities present, present in everyone. And this is why it moves closer to a Christian notion of this. This is one of my, my, my pet peeves with the Lord of the Rings, uh, the film version, is it leans too far in presenting the fellowship as being good 
and Mordor and the creatures from Mordor as being evil. And then the good guys win and the evil's gone. And it's just totally eradicated and it's all good now. And Aragorn stands in the city and he marries Arwen and there's light and there's no evil after it's all gone. He, they remove the scouring of the Shire. There's none of that. Evil does not persist. But in the book it does. And that's because the evil's within the company itself and destroying the ring does not destroy evil. It doesn't destroy it. It destroys a way in which evil can manifest itself, but evil's not gone. Very important for Tolkien. Um, and in this poem, evil is there even within the company. It's even within the heroes. There's something about them which makes bad judgments. So what we need, given that fact, is a code of ethics, a code of conduct. This is what good the good guys do. And here's what the good guys don't do. And if the good guys don't follow the code, then that's an evil action and they're punished for it. So there's an expectation that they follow the code. And this is how they build up trust. And because of those bonds of trust, which is part of the, the way in which the good is portrayed in this, uh, kings can trust their vassals because they pledge themselves and they give rings of fealty. They, they know that those bonds of trust which characterize a, a loving society will hold against evil. But if they break their word and if they break their trust and if they don't hold to what is good, mostly the oath that they've sworn to the king who's also sworn to God, then it all comes tumbling down. And, and this, is what is, this is what the uh, monster Grendel most hates. He hates uh, Hirot, which is the center of the kingdom here, which is a place of light, like the King of the Golden Hall in The Lord of the Rings, where Theoden the king dwells, and it's a place of light and feasting and celebration and music and song and joy and community. Uh, Grendel hates that because he is a solitary in the marshes that hates the light and hates festivity and hates civilization. He's a bit like the figure we saw back in the Odyssey, uh, the uh, Polyphemus, the Cyclops, who can only see with one eye and doesn't associate with other Cyclops. He's a solitary. He lives in, in the presence of nature. And uh, Homer doesn't think that's good. And neither does the Beowulf poet, and neither should we. We should not so identify nature with goodness that we think that we can avoid evil by going back to nature. It's an enormous fallacy of our day. Part of the dark green movement of our day is that ridiculous fallacy. Uh, so that's a key, a key theme. In fact, it's the main theme, the battle between good and evil. Another one is the contrast between youth and age. I, I want you to pay attention to this one because at the beginning of the uh, encounter, and, it's the, and it, it covers the first two battles between Beowulf and Grendel and then Grendel's mother, we have the young man Beowulf, the young hero, dashing, young, supremely powerful. Able to, go, able to go hand to hand with Grendel and, and win. Tear his arm off, break him physically. He doesn't even want a weapon. That's how strong he is. <laughs> and the third battle, which is the battle that happens 50 years later, and Beowulf now is no longer just a young buck trying to earn his spurs in the court. He's now the king and he's an old man. And he's been ruling over the people and Evil has not gone away. It slept for 50 years and now it wakes up again because somebody has taken a gold trinket from the dragon just by accident, falls in there, takes it, and the dragon comes out and is going to destroy the whole kingdom over that trifle. And Beowulf, the old king, now rides out once more to try and defend his kingdom. And there's a different calculus in what constitutes heroism in young men and in old men. And that contrast is important. So second theme, um, and 
thirdly, I think there's interesting the connection between the old pagan traditions and um, the, tra the new traditions of, of the Christian religion are presented in this. As I say, uh, the poet is, to my mind, certainly a Christian. And he makes it clear in the poem, we'll come to this, that idol worshiping is a, is a threat to Christianity. Although he makes no comment when Beowulf um, uh, commits pagan uh, funeral rites, he, doesn't, he just doesn't pass comment on it. Well, of course he does, he's a pagan. Makes no comment, that doesn't mean he agrees with it. He's just describing what a pagan would do in this situation. Um, and, and Beowulf, the character, is not concerned with Christian virtues either. So there's a, an attempt at realism here. He's not interested in humility or meekness. He's not interested in, in poverty. He's not interested in, um, in charity even, really. He doesn't want to show love to Grendel <laughs> by being compassionate. Well, you, you know, you must have had a hard life and I, I'm going to tolerate this and, and try and, and win you, convict you by my selfless character. There's none of that. This is a, 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 an enemy that he needs to defeat physically in combat. So he's not marked by Christian virtues. When I say the poet is Christian, that doesn't mean Beowulf, the hero, is Christian. He, he's a pagan. But we do think we can see signs that the uh, poet does posit a sort of Christian heroism, but he doesn't give it to Beowulf so much, but a minor character called Hrothgar. Hrothgar seems something like an Old Testament king who is trying to preserve his kingdom and has all sorts of challenges around him, not the least of which is his own uh, people are corrupt in some ways. And he wants to fight against, he wants to preserve his kingdom against the threats, uh, not only on the outside, but also within. And the way he does this is, is waiting on God for a deliverance. And the deliverance comes in the person of Beowulf. So there's a bit of, of all that. Uh, comments or questions at this stage? I'll, I'll uh, dip into this a little bit. No? Okay. Um, in terms of historical background, I think I can find this. There's a nice map I think I saw here as well. Uh, Beowulf on Wikipedia. Not usually, no, I don't want the translation. There. This was useful. Can I get this without? No. OK, back to this. So Herat is probably up, so up, up here in this area where it says angles and brackets and then Danes and, and Utes, that's Denmark. And the tribes mentioned here, uh, Beowulf probably begins in, in, uh, in Sweden and then swims across the channel to uh, the land of the Danes, the, the, the Jutes and the, and the Angles and so forth. These are all different types of um, tribes in the day with different tongues for that matter. You, you'll know a lot of the Frisians because they came over to Canada. It's, uh, and the Aust Frisians and the West Frisians and all that sort of stuff. And the, the poem probably, well, it gives it something of a chronology here, but Herat is presented not in England, even though it's written in Anglo-Saxon. The story is brought to East Anglia and probably lodged there. It's found in a manuscript in the, in the 19th century, by the way. It's unknown in Shakespeare's period, in Milton's period, anything before it. So this poem was lodged in a library and found, found with, the, with the edges of the, of the parchment burnt in a fire, the cotton manuscript. <coughs> Fascinating thing, this great poem unknown throughout basically a millennium, but kept in libraries and then discovered. It's a, the story itself is interesting. The Noel Codex, um, part of uh, Sir Robert Cotton's collection of medieval manuscript. 
and it, it, it moves around in various places. But at any rate, um, it takes place probably in the, as I say, in the seventh century it, in accordance with probably some sort of historical documents. And there's a, there's a mixing or a blending of, of fictional and legendary and mythic and historical documents. Beowulf isn't even mentioned in any other manu uh, Anglo-Saxon manuscript. So he's just not even mentioned. But others that he mentions are in this period, and that's, the, that's with the dating. So there does appear to be Scandinavian sources for some of the individuals, but even the clans that are mentioned. So that is where the dating comes from, historical. Oh, that, they're, they're in this period, and then that tribe disappears. Okay, so if they disappear, it's not after that period, it's before that. So that, that's where the dating comes from. Um, 6th century Scandinavia or something like that. And then written down later, because it's an oral tradition that eventually gets passed down and, and written down by some king, commissions it and says, okay, let's, enough of this oral tradition, let's put it down so that it's preserved and this is the perfect rendition of it. Any question? At this stage? No, okay. All right then. Um, so, what did I do with this? Uh, there have been some that have thought that the poem was maybe written by multiple authors. I think the unity of the poem probably prevents us uh, from coming to that conclusion or forbids us from coming to it really. There's a real unity to the whole thing uh, that suggests the work of one writer but again we don't even know who the writer is so you're not going to you're not going to prove that one way or the other uh, in terms of the structure so i mentioned the alliteration uh, another feature of the prose is uh, or the poem is that it's written in kennings there's something called kennings in there and kenning is to name a person or a thing using a phrase that signifies of the qu a quality of the person or a thing so um a warrior might be a helmet-bearing person. Uh, the, the sea is called the whale road in the poem. The whale road is, and it's not Porky Pig that can't say railroad, it's the, the whale road. It's, he, it's where the whales traverse the sea. That's the sea. So that's a kenning. Um, I think he, he, uh, he calls the ribs a bone, a bone cage. So those kennings mark the poem as probably a, an oral poem as well. Um, he also often uses understatement in, in the poem. But there's a, a very clear style here. And, uh, but alliteration is the main mark of it. Anglo-Saxon verse, alliteration, they love alliteration. Uh, let's read some of it. And I'm going to skip over. I'm not going to attempt and fail to read in my poor Anglo-Saxon, although I could do it at one point. We'll just do it with the English, and we'll, we'll read he uh, Seamus Heaney's translation. So, the spear Danes in days gone by, and the kings who ruled them had courage and greatness. We have heard of those princes' heroic campaigns. There was Shield Sheafson, scourge of many tribes, a wrecker of mead benches, rampaging among foes. This terror of the hall troops had come far. A foundling to start with, he would flourish later on as his powers waxed and his worth was proved. In the end, each clan on the outlying coasts beyond the whale road had to yield to him and begin to pay tribute. That was one good king. That was good kerning. You can see there's, see it comes from the same, same language, right? In German, kerning is a, a king. Afterwards, a boy child was born to shield a cub in the yard, a comfort sent by God to that nation. He knew that, he, that they had been thold, 
the long times and troubles they'd come through without a leader. So the Lord of life, the glorious Almighty, made this man renowned. Shield had fathered a famous son. Baal's name was known throughout the north. And a young prince must be prudent like that, giving freely while his father lives, so that afterwards in an age when fighting starts, steadfast companions will stand by him and hold the line. Behavior that's admired is the path to power among people everywhere. Sage advice. Do what's admirable. Be selfless when you're young. Give things away. You'll be drawn, they'll be drawn to you not by being paid, but by being your, your good character. Again, it's an epic for this reason as well. Shield was still thriving when his time came, and he crossed over into the Lord's keeping. His warrior band did what he bade them when he laid down the law among the Danes. They shouldered him out to the sea's flood, the chief they revered who had long ruled them. A ring world prow rode in the harbor, ice clad, outbound, a craft for a prince. They stretched their beloved lord in his boat, laid out by the mast amidships, the great ring giver. Or rings are a sign of fealty. They're given as a, ple as, as a, a pledge of, or a troth. Part of truth is troth. It's, it's, a, it's an allegiance. It's a bond. It's a covenant. This, the ring which is given by the Lord to his vassals represents a fealty from the king to his vassal. And it's repaid in kind through service and trust and bravery. He, pro he promises to serve his Lord. His Lord promises to provide for him uh, in his every need. Far-fetched treasures were piled upon him and precious gear. Well, he's dead. I never heard before of a ship so well furbished with battle tackle, bladed weapons, and loads of mail, coats of mail. The mass treasure was loaded on top of him. It would travel far out into the ocean's sway. They decked his body no less bountifully with offerings than those first ones did who cast him away when he was a child and launched him alone out over the waves. They set a gold standard up high above his head and let him drift to wind and tide, bewailing him and mourning their loss. No man can tell. No wise man in hull or weathered veteran knows for certain who salvaged that load. So they put him on a, on a ship and put him out to sea. He lands somewhere. They don't care. So then it fell to Baal to keep the forts. He was well regarded and ruled the Danes for a long time after his father took leave of his life on earth. And then his heir, the great half Dane, held sway for as long as he lived, their elder and warlord. He was four times a father, this fighter prince. One by one they entered the world. Hirogar, Hrothgar, the good Halga, and a daughter I have heard who is Onala's queen a balm in bed to the battle-scarred Swede. The fortunes of war favored Hrothgar. Friends and kinsmen flocked to his ranks. Young followers, a force that grew to be a mighty army. So his mind turned to hall building. He handed down orders to men to work on a great mead hall, meant to be a wonder of the world forever. It would be his throne room. And there he would dispense his God-given goods to young and old, but not the common land or people's lives. Far and wide through the world I have heard orders for work to adorn that wallstead were sent to many peoples. And soon it stood there, finished and ready in full view. The Hall of Halls. Hirot was the name he settled on it, whose utterance was law. Nor did he renege, but doled out rings and torques at the table. Torques are like a necklace of some sort, but um, thicker. The hall towered its gables wide and high and awaiting a barbarous burning. Ooh, what? Hold on. What was this? It's all the golden age. 
the Hurats belt, symbol of civilization. Mead drinking. Mead is uh, honey wine. It's fermented. Drink it. Celebration. Cheer. Artisans have come all over to build this hall. The hall towered its gables wide and high and wait, awaiting a barbarous burning. What? Doom. That doom abided, but in time it would come. The killer instinct unleashed among in-laws. So again, it's within. This is the problem. The evil which the hall seemed to keep outside is still inside. They can't keep the evil out. The bloodlust rampant. Then a powerful demon, a prowler through the dark, nursed a hard grievance. It harrowed him to hear the din of the loud banquet every day in the hall, the harp being struck and the clear song of a skilled poet telling with mastery of man's beginnings how the Almighty had made the earth a gleaming plain girdled with waters. In his splendor he set the sun and the moon to be earth's lamplight, lanterns for men, and filled the broad lap of the world with branches and leaves and quickened life and every other thing that moved. So times were pleasant for the people there until finally one, a fiend out of hell, began to work his evil in the world. Grendel was the name of this grim demon, haunting the marshes, marauding round the heath and the desolate fens. He had dwelt for a time in misery among the banished monsters, Cain's clan, whom the creator had outlawed and condemned as outcasts. For the killing of Abel, the eternal Lord had exacted a price. Cain got no good from committing that murder because the Almighty made him anathema, and out of the curse of his exile there sprang ogres and elves and evil phantoms, and the giants too, who strove with God time and again until he gave them their reward. Is he uh, aware of the Book of the Giants and the Book of Enoch? There's a part of the Book of Enoch, not in the canon of Scripture, but um, an old apocryphal work called the Book of Enoch, which it talks about the giants, the giants that strode the earth and so forth. Um, the descendants of Cain, allied evil beings that oppose God and his will. Who knows? Again, allusions to this, but again, and he's not interested in the exactitude of it, but he is talking about a whole world which is not just peopled with monsters, but with evil monsters. So after nightfall, Grendel set out for the lofty house to see how the ring Danes were settling into it after their drink. And there he came upon them, a company of the best to sleep from their feasting, insensible to pain and human sorrow. They're sozzled, drunk, sleeping, very happily falling asleep after a lot of mead, I guess. Suddenly then the God-cursed brute was creating havoc. Greedy and grim, he grabbed 30 men from their resting places and rushed to his lair, flushed up and inflamed from the raid, blundering back with the butchered corpses. So this is not a man. He grabs 30 of them. How does he grab 30 of them exactly? must be rather large, extremely strong. He grabs them, 30 of the warriors at night, and butchers them. For what purpose? It wasn't, there's no call to war. There's no declaration. He just does it because he hates. Just motivated by hatred, nothing else. Attacks them while they're asleep. Cowardly act demonstrates the evil of the uh, figure of Grendel. Then as dawn brightened and the day broke, Grendel's powers of destruction were plain. Their wassail, their drinking and feasting, was over. They wept to heaven and mourned under mourning. Their mighty prince, the story leader, sat stricken and helpless, humiliated by the loss of his guard, bewildered and stunned, staring aghast, at the demon's trail in deep distress. He was numb with grief, but got no respite, for one night later, 
Merciless Grendel struck again with more gruesome murders. Malignant by nature, he never showed remorse. It was easy then to meet with a man shifting himself to a safer distance, to bed in, in the Bothies. For who could be blind to the evidence of his eyes, the obviousness of that hall watcher's hate? Whoever escaped kept a weather eye open and moved away. So the place where human community has formed is now not only is now being a place of, of extreme danger. That's the exact place you don't want to congregate. If you're there, you're going to be killed. Don't go. So, so the Hirat is there, but it's empty. It's not burnt, by the way. It's not going to be burnt until the dragon comes. So that premonition or that hint of what's to come is not a reference to Grendel, but rather the third of the monsters. It was, it was destined for burning. It was doomed to burn. He's encompassing the whole tale right there in the beginning of it. Again, an indication that there is a, that one poet behind the whole episode of these things. So Grendel ruled in defiance of right. There's the uh, authorial comment of the Beowulf poet. He ruled in defiance of right. It wasn't just that he was opposed to these, these men. He was against right and wrong. He was a bad and evil being. One against all until the greatest house in the world stood empty, a deserted wallstead. For 12 winters, seasons of woe, the Lord of the Shielding suffered under his load of sorrow. And so, before long, the news was known over the whole world. Sad lays were sung about the beset king, the vicious raids and ravages of Grendel, his long and an unrelenting feud, nothing but war how he would never parley or make peace with any Dane, nor stop his death dealing, nor pay the death price. Uh, Wehrgeld, uh, in, in the Anglo-Saxon world, if you kill somebody, you pay his relatives money for the man because you've taken his life. His families have lost a loved one and there's money that's to be paid for that. Even if he deserved to die, you still give them money because they've lost somebody who will be looking after a family or is a beloved son. You pay this and in part to prevent further bloodshedding, endless bloodshedding, some sort of compensation. He won't pay anything. He recognizes no injustice. That's how evil he is. So he's not, he, he, he ignores that there are rules and laws that govern conduct. Again, just like Polyphemus, the Cyclops, Odysseus says to him, are you not afraid of the, of the gods? And when you treat strangers with this, not only with a lack of hospitality, but you're going to eat your, your, your guests, the gods in heaven will punish you for this. What do I care? It's a representation of evil. Yes. Really? Yes. Okay. So it was not, I don't think <laughs> no, no. We're not supposed to sympathize with Grendel. I wouldn't either, but I've seen the topic in the um, We're going to have to come to that topic because there is a certainly a strong proclivity in our day with thinking that uh, an individual, however evil they are and however evil their acts are, and nobody's, I assume, in that conversation is going to deny that Grendel's acts are evil they're still going to say that there must be some reason that somebody could do something this bad. And so we ought to just, if we could just understand what it's like to be Grendel, then we could address the causes that make Grendel evil. So they make evil out to be a superficial thing and don't really understand the full depravity of evil. And they probably deny that evil is a part of the human condition as well. They're probably Pelagians. They think that human beings are basically good and everything's basically good. And what makes evil evil is society. And if he was just socialized differently, then Grendel would be okay. He just needed to go to the public school system and then he would be inclusive and tolerant and, 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 and he would love everybody. <laughs> that, that, would, that, would be all, that would solve all the problems, right? And I think, no, I, I don't agree with this at all. Um, I think it's manifestly false and ridiculous, actually. 
but people are really wedded to the idea that there, that there aren't really evil entities. And in a sense, they're correct that there is a commonality among human beings. We do share the sin of Adam. We're all uh, deserving of God's wrath. That's, that's Christian theology, actually. But that doesn't mean that, that people uh, are, are guiltless, basically. And it can be all explained and corrected by just better socialization. That doesn't address the problem of evil. The problem of evil is it, it goes, it cuts right through into the human heart. We're made in the image of God. However, because of Adam's sin, we are subject to Adam's uh, God denying uh, proclivities, which are shown by his first son, Cain, who slew his brother. And in that sense, Grendel is like us, except he doesn't repent, doesn't want to repent, and he gets more and more and more and more evil, which is also something about the problem of sin is that sin loves sin, it becomes even more sinful, and evil becomes ever more evil when it's not corrected. And he represents that. He is evil upon evil. You're not supposed to understand him. Can you understand Cain's sin against his brother? They would probably argue you could. I don't know if they would. But again, they're going to explain every act of evil as you just need to understand it from his perspective and then it wouldn't be so bad. That's, nobody agrees with this view, historically, except the Pelagians who deny that human beings are sinful. Okay. I think original sin is the only empirically verifiable doctrine of the church. The only one. Where does evil come from then? Anyway, um, so back to this. He won't even pay the death price. He's not going to acknowledge that a harm has been done, a wrong has been done. He's not going to give any concession to that because he hates and nothing can placate his hatred. No counselor. He doesn't, even, he doesn't want to come into Hurat. He's happy to dwell where he is. He loves evil. He hates good. No counselor could ever expect fair reparation from those rabid hands. All were endangered. Young and old were hunted down by that dark death shadow who lurked and swooped in the long nights on the misty moors. Nobody knows where these reavers from hell roam on their errands. Okay. So it goes from the height of glory. We have the good king Hrothgar. He builds Herat, the symbol of civilization. And then immediately evil strikes and obliterates and scatters the good. So Grendel waged his lonely war, inflicting constant cruelties on the people. Atrocious hurt. He took over Hurat, haunted the glittering hall after dark, but the throne itself, the treasure seat, he was kept from approaching. He was the Lord's outcast. So God restrains the capacities of his uh, evil here. It's only God that restrains his hand. He, he won't, he's not able to inhabit that. He's, remember, Cain is an exile. He can't ever be at peace. These were hard times, heartbreaking for the prince of the shieldings. Powerful counselors, the highest in the land, would lend advice, plotting how best the bold defenders might resist and beat off sudden attacks. Sometimes at pagan shrines, they vowed offerings to idols, swore oaths that the killer of souls might come to their aid and save the people. Oh, swore oaths to th that the killer of souls might come to the aid. So swear oaths to whom? The devil. Yes. Come, help us. We're going to offer the idolatry and devil worship are connected by the poet. That was their way. Their heathenish hope. Deep in their hearts, they remembered hell. The almighty judge of good deeds and bad, the Lord God, head of the heavens and high king of the world, was unknown to them. O oh, cursed is he who in time of trouble has to thrust his soul in the fire's embrace, forfeiting help. He has nowhere to turn. But blessed is he 
who after death can approach the Lord and find friendship in the Father's embrace. This is again the poet's comment on the episode. So that troubled time continued. Woe that never stopped. Remember, so he's telling ancient history from the vantage point of a Christian point of view, but telling us about how pagans approach these things. So that troubled time continued. Woe that never stopped. Steady affliction for half Dane's son. Too hard an ordeal. There was panic after dark. People endured raids in the night, riven by the terror. I'm going to come up to Beowulf next time because Beowulf is going to respond to this the plight of his uh, kindred, Hrothgar. And he's going to come from afar. He's going to swim across the sea, uh, a heroic deed. And next time we'll pick him up and we'll look at the three battles uh, between Beowulf and the three monsters. Okay, I'll see you then.